Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to our artist talk with uh, Noi Tanagawa and Ara Reyes. I'm here um, with two of the artists from Kopoeo Kaka'ako, who are featured in our Artists of Hawaii Now exhibition. I'm Marlene Sue, and I'm the co-curator of Artists of Hawaii Now, and I'm so excited to be here with these amazing artists. Um, I'm just going to go over a few logistical things first before we begin. So once again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, before we get started, um, if you would like to turn on your closed captioning, please hit the CC bottom, button in the bottom right corner of your screen. Also, um, we will be taking questions from the audience throughout the duration of this um, event. So if you do have a question for the artist, I invite you to please um, type in your question to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we'll be moder moder monitoring those questions um, throughout the entire event. So please feel free to add your thoughts, add any questions that you may have for the artist, and we'll, um, we'll discuss them throughout this event. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So um, I would like to first introduce our guest here. So I'm here with Ara Reyes, and Ara is a community builder based in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, Ara lived unsheltered for nearly eight years and spent her last five years in Kaka'aka. While there, she forged connections between the houseless community and service providers. Currently, Ara sits on the board of partners in CARE, which coordinates Oahu houseless services. She is an affordable housing for all fellows, linking housing struggles across the state. Where Ara is a founding member of Kapoyo Kapako. Thank you so much for being here, Ara. Welcome. Thank you. So great to have you. Um, I am also here with her fellow collaborator, Noi Tanagawa. And Noi Tanagawa is an artist and award-winning journalist based in Honolulu, Hawaii. Noi won the 2021 Regional Edward R. Murrow Award for her series Unsheltered in Honolulu on Hawaii Public Radio. Her bi-weekly program, the Aloha Friday Conversation, covers art, culture, and ideas in Hawaii. Noi's most recent arts residency was in 2015 for the Arts and Embassies Program with the U.S. State Department in the Republic of Palau. Noi, thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, I think you're still muted, Noi. Thank you so much. Really, mahalo to the museum and to you personally, Marlene, as well as Taylor. <laughs> no, I can honestly say it's been an honor to be to work with the both of you. Um, so I guess to get started, you know, um, Kapoyo Kaka'ako is not only the, the title of your work featured in Artists of Hawaii now, it also represents the, the collective that you both are part of, and it also re represents a larger community. And I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of a, a historical background on how this community got started, how your collective came to be, um, just so we just can see this, this journey that you've all been through. That was a very long journey. <laughs> but um, so we were um, houseless, uh, living in the Kakako Park area. And um, we had some outside people came in one day and they just started to talk story with some of, some of us in the park. And, and uh, they would come like once a week. And that's how it actually really got started with the whole coming together in the community. Um, they would just come and we would talk stories. They just wanted to hear our side of the story, wanted to hear people's stories, you know, and then then maybe about a year later or so, they came, um, there was like a break and then they came back. And that's when um, we started doing like weekly cleanups. That's when that ha uh, happened. So we, we had a group of people in that, uh, Kakako Park houses community that would meet once a week in the park. Uh, we would have like a little community meeting and then we would clean up the park and then efforts grew. 
And then it expanded to um, Children's Discovery Center, uh, where one of the other leaders had approached the owner of Children's Discovery Center and apologized for um, any negative impacts that we've had on her center and or for the kids or and her business, and that wasn't our intentions. And so we had moved the rest of the houses people away, and then it started from there. Um, we got. We started cleaning up not only the park where we were staying, the park where we were staying around Discovery Center, and then it expanded to all the lower uh, gateway parks, then to the side streets, <laughs> and then it grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. So it started off with like just a handful of people that were in this community, right? And then it ended up at one point being like 98 people who were willing to um, if I had an opportunity, we're, we're actually contributing to be a part of the community and we're also willing to move to a Kahale should one had been available at the time. Is there anything Which else? Cool because, you know, they started working inside the system. They had like a community patrol. They had, they started going to neighborhood board meetings and really won over the neighborhood board. And Loretta Yajima from the uh, Children's Discovery Center had just been through it and had been publicly so um, disturbed by the change in her, you know, immediate environment of the Children's Discovery Center. She became one of their greatest advocates after they, I don't know what you could, after you massaged her with all of your <laughs> efforts. After we moved all the other houses away from the community, from around her center, and then we cleaned up not only whatever rubbish the houses had left behind, but we cleaned up all inside her plants. And like, she had a whole manicure makeover for her center. I mean, they cried and they're like, you know, in all the years that they were there, they never were able to um, actually clean it and, and make it look the way that it had looked after we were done. So that was like awesome. And then they got those great powwow murals. <laughs> How they are like, they're sad, they're, they're good. But I mean, that, that was the kind of outreach. And then, you know, like even taking, okay, so you're working with the community entities that are already there. Then they started super getting proactive and actually um, inviting service providers into the community to um, to be there at times when they would invite other homeless from all over, like Ala Moana, Makiki, you know, over by the harbor and stuff to come, knowing that these service providers would be right there in Kakaoka Makai Park. Yeah, that was an amazing uh, organizing effort. Uh, yeah. I'm say, all right. So that one was we had met with service providers and we wanted to know how we could get services to the people in our community, you know, and get them better connected. And knowing, um, addressing the fact that there was a lack um, or a gap in so outreach services and, you know, provider client services. And um, there were people related, you know, you just, and keeping appointments and stuff. It's yeah. just a little easier here. So we organized the service event, a service fair event where all the the main providers that uh, the people in the community needed help with or wanted assistance from or needed wanted to access. Yeah, right. What else was there? There was that was like that's a major one. They had the community for outreach, had the legal aid, had the housing, PIC was there, Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. We did um, a rise and Halikipa was there. And what was that? Um, those were even there. <laughs> and Shea Weiss. Yes, Shea Weiss was the winner. <laughs> that everybody there. <laughs> And we had DHS was there where they had come down and did process applications and interviews right there in the park so that people were able to complete that service with them because that was a lack in their system, right? People being able to not keep appointments or not being able to keep appointments. So they did everything right there, which was awesome. <laughs> and speaking of which, we have another service event coming up. <laughs> We had one planned in September that didn't fall through because of numbers and you know the variant and 
all of that. So, but we're planning for another one in January. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, you should know, you should find out what that requires. You know, it requires Aura going all, all around, driving around, just looking for people. Uh, I know now it's gotten a lot harder. You know, it was easier reaching out to people or connecting with people or getting them on the right track, you know, like to where they were being accountable for their, their actions and, and abiding by our community rules. And, but then now they're so spread apart and they're all alone. Like they're, so they're separate, right? From each other. And it's, you can't be everywhere at one time. So it's hard to build, to keep that community. You know what I mean? Uh, where people are engaged with each other and helping one another kind of thing. Everybody's just on the move all the time. So that's been a really big um, barrier recently in the last couple of years or year or two. And, you know, we have a new city administration here and, you know, that came in with a lot of saying that they, they had some new ideas, new strategies for handling houseless um, situation, but on the street, I mean, tell me if this is wrong, Aura, what we've really seen is the compassionate disruptions have been now called cleanups, and they're really, ever. You know, they're more of them. And on Maui, it's the same thing. It's been <clears throat> ramping up over there. And um, I just talked this week with someone who uh, was moved from Kanaha Park, uh, along with about, uh, there, they had up to 90 people living there at one point. Uh, they were moved in such a way that the ACLU, out of all the sweeps in the state, this one, the ACLU has come in and said, you know, you guys are, uh, have been, uh, have violating uh, people's rights in terms of uh, where the property and uh, where they're allowed to stay. So, um, <laughs> They're, they're like one of those problems that's ongoing now, and a lot of people are working on it in a lot of different. Hey guys, this is John, and I <laughs> want to tell you that one of the things, the saddest tonight, as we're talking to you, is John Montanola has not been here. <laughs> Let me find out where he is. Just a second, John. Hi. This is so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, with, with all of the, you know, you know, how you're talking about, you know, everybody's so spread apart now and that, you know, it's really hard for you to keep that community and um, with the, with the disruptions or the, the sweeps now, it's, it seems like even more relevant and even more urgent that you have the work featured in your exhibition for people to really be able to connect and see that journey, that history. And so can you talk a little bit about the work that's in the exhibition? Okay. Um, wait, can I add something before we move on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Previously to this whole community building and the creation of this Kapoyo Kaka'ako community, uh, I don't, I mean, people have heard uh, Kaka'ako at one point had 350, over 350 homeless people and they had their own little houses that they had built. And I mean, they had built their own community. There was like two corner stores. There was, <laughs> I mean, they had their own security, their own security patrol and their own, um, you know, just things like that, right? And there was people in the neighborhood that would babysit or whatever, right? Like they had really established their own community, but not to the point where they were actually being uh, contributing anything back into into society or around them, right? So I can see where that negative aspect of them being there had come in because it was kind of like just their own rules, right? But I think had we built the community when we had that village, I think it would have been a lot different and things might have taken a turn in another rate, in another way, you know what I mean? So I just wanted to like mention that, mention that. I think I was gonna go somewhere else with it, but I totally lost tr my train of thought. <laughs> well, I, think, I think we have um, we have some images of like the, the work that you've done with the community so far. Did you wanna talk a little bit about those images before we talk about the work in the exhibition? Sure. 
I don't know what images do you have? <laughs> and you know, our um, when we started going to the neighborhood board meetings, they were actually, it only took about two to three meetings before we had their support. Like, their for real, they were behind us support and they wanted to help us kind of support. And it took about three meetings before the people, the residents, outlook or perception of our community um, before they started to change. So, I mean, it's not something that's too far fetched or like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It happens and I mean, good things happen, right? When we come together. Okay, so, yes. Oh, <laughs> we, uh, just, just to let everyone know, we have one more artist joining us from Kapoyo Kata also. Um, so, Noi will be back shortly with um, John Montanona as well. But, Ara, I don't know, um, we have a picture on screen here where it's uh, development in Kaka'ako. And um, do you want to talk a little bit why, about um, just, you know, the images that we see on screen and how that kind of impacts the work then that we will next see um, through these slides? I'm not oh. sure. I can go on and on and on because right now I just um, joined the Affordable Housing Coalition uh, for policy, for um, the policy, for to implement policy for the next leg le next legislative session, 2022. And um, so I can go on and on and on about this and the houses and the other and our uh, wider communities. There need there cannot be affordable. We cannot build affordable homes and require these new buildings to set aside a percentage of units as affordable homes, you know, and we're saying, no, we're going to develop and we're going to have all these affordable units available, but they're only available for 30 years. After 30 years, they, they go to fair market value, which means now the next generation coming up or the people who are now out and can't afford that home or their kids or whoever want to stay there and rent cannot. So now we need to build more affordable housing, which is kind of ridiculous. So that's where I'm at in this fight with <laughs> what I feel like where policy should change. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure people have a lot of um, other things to say on that, but that's just my opinion. You know, I don't see the, um, my personal opinion, I don't see how you can mandate a portion of something to be affordable, but then let it become not affordable. It doesn't add to your housing stock. You know what I mean? It keeps dropping out. So every time you let something in, another one will drop out. And then it's just a never ending cycle. You're still left with not enough housing or not enough affordable housing. Does that make sense? You know, could I add that here's a, here's a slide. Welcome to Kaka Up. Oh, like what she said, what are us is exactly what happened here. We were thinking that we could get enough affordable housing as a percentage of what developers wanted to build. No, that does not work. That simply doesn't work. <laughs> um, what? We need to, be more targeted about that and build housing that is affordable. And when you look around the world, there are so many places that have done it and they've done it in all kinds of different ways. They've done it like in Austria where, you know, they just, where things have been so regulated for years that people, you know, they're just like in New York, they're generations. Finland. Housing rent control and stuff like that. They, they've done it a different way in Houston where they have no zoning. You know, I mean, so there are different ways of getting this housing going, but I mean, really housing can be built. It's not an insurmountable task. And you know what, what R is saying, uh, she's, she's talking about how people begin to realize that it's needed. And that's how I met Ara and John. It was because this group of people, Hui Aloha, it's basically three people, um, um, Kathy Kawano Ching, James Koshiba and Alani Apio, you know, basically just these three individuals who 
operate as Hui Aloha, just started talking to people and they think it's it just coffee and donuts. <laughs> just showing up. You know, just showing up, right, John? Yeah. And it turns out that showing up and cleaning up are like really work wonders because it's really cleaning up together. Honestly, cleaning up with you guys, that's the first thing you know we started doing together. And I gotta say it, it feels great. It does. You're still doing it. Yeah, and still doing it. And John, this is John Montanona. He's staying out right. now at hey, John. Uh, Halimali Ola, and you know they're going on there every every weekend. Uh, yeah. Oh, let, let me let me um, let me introduce John to everyone. Uh, hi, John. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so, John Montanona lived on the streets of Kakako for over twenty years. Um, John was recognized as the go-to person for dry clothes, extra tents tools or food of any at any time of the day or night. He worked in the kitchen at Michelle, next fish market and other eateries. Currently John lives at a transitional shelter and works full time at the Institute for Human Services. John has deep connections on the Kakako waterfront and is a founding member of Kapoyo Kakako. Thank you so much for being here John. We're so happy to have you. you. you um, yes, so yeah, definitely continue with the conversation. I just wanted to make sure that I um, introduced John properly. <laughs> that was a great photo she had of Kakaapo for you. I don't know, not one person that lived there. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> we street and look up and like, you know, we watch them build on the next thing you know, people living there, but no local, no local people. Oh, man. <laughs> Those guys being there, this and that, you know, you become sorry at times when, you know, you, you know, you're there, you know, we're in their way. You know, and someone's still called cops on it, you know, so, you know, you look at that and say, no way we're going to park with you there. None of us. You know, that's, that's sad. You know, people work hard in Hawaii. They work hard for what they get. And, you know, it's like us, hey, we're trying to get a piece of land for go out, you know. We're all free, but we on three years now. Or some kind of complication, or liability, you know, and it's very frustrating right now. And we're talking about the original Kapoyo Kakaako community members that are still unhoused. Um, they were they were told that they, uh, we would be, well, there is a piece of land that the state had set aside for our, our Kahale, but then all of a sudden there was a liability issues and permitting issues and well it happens to be kind of in the middle street area where there's a lot of action going on now in terms of discussion of what that area will become so it's very possible that property that was formerly seen as not usable now looks more valuable we went there one now that it's, we cleaned it out <laughs> it's great but Huh. You, you talk about mm -hmm. you but see, that was the idea, right? Was to be a community already and to move as a community as a community a housing place. Because right. that's what happens with housing developments or you know, uh, housing housing situations is they deteriorate because there's no community inside there. If you move as a community, the odds of success, this is what people think would be improved. Well, there was a number of our Kapo'eo Kaka'ako members that moved into Halimaliola Navigational Shelter together. Um, because they all went together, I mean, we've had a number of members who, who, who has been housed, who are now in, currently in permanent housing. And whereas, I mean, people we, you never ever would have thought would have went into their own homes and stayed there. But because they have a community to come back and connect with and work with, um, they come they come down, they help out, they go home, you know what I mean? So it's it's been really nice to see the change and growth. All right. You know, what is that transition like? Going from, <laughs> well, yeah, going into housing. Talk about that a little bit. Hmm. 
um, well, it's traumatic losing your home. It's and after you've lost your home for so long, you learn to adapt, and you learn that you survive. You can survive without it, and um, moving back into a home can it becomes just as traumatic as it was when you lost your home. Um, How there, so? Huh? How so? Well, there are other factors now that take place. Um, you're by yourself. You're now moved back into a world that you don't know or that is unfamiliar to you. Um, times, life moves on regardless, you know, if you're ready to move with it or not. Um, when you're living on the street, there is no concept of time. And so we kind of just stay in whatever time it was that when we got there, that's usually the time that we stay in until we leave, you know. Um, but when you move back into a house after you've been out there for so long, uh, there's been so much changes and, and advancements and technologies and different, you know, different new buildings, uh, new everything, right? Like, so you just, you feel lost, you feel alone. You, there's, you usually move into, they put you in a house, but there's no furniture, there's no, you know what I mean? So your resources, unless they put you somewhere that's close to where you normally would have stayed, you know, if you stayed on the street, maybe you might go back home and back out, but it's really hard to um, get used to, to the idea that you have your own home or closing your door or, yeah. Well, Ara, I just wanted to share with you um, a comment um, from our audience. So Ka'ili, um, she wanted to say, she said she really appreciates your communication of the fact that the de designated of affordable units is only good for 30 years. It is hard to fathom that if you find a unit at age 30, you may be out at age 60. It can be a very difficult situation to find another affordable unit. Um, did you want to, do you have any comment on that? Uh -huh. Do you want to elaborate on that? I have lots of comments. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I agree 100%. That has been my argument. If you're going to designate so many units to be affordable, it should always stay affordable. I feel that that's how it should be. You know, if, there, if you want to build, okay, we're going to allow you to build, but you have to have so many units affordable and then just keep it affordable because you're right. After 30 years, then what happens to those people or what happens to the new people who are coming into poverty because of inflation or our economy or whatever it is, right? Like most, majority, most families here in Hawaii, we live doubled up or, you know what I'm saying? And or, I think talking about close to six percent inflation this year really it's you know, crazy you have to look at too how you know how can you get developers interested to do it they got to make a buck they absolutely <laughs> have to or else why would they do it so you know you have to think you have to that's basically what happens you have to weigh the give backs and i'm telling you it's been brutal <laughs> because what happens is you have to look for subsidies from the government or possibly breaks on land here in Hawaii. That is where. And I've talked to DLNR and they said, well, you know, we've looked everywhere. We there really don't see actually too many <laughs> land available. Land everywhere. <laughs> Oh, no, really, but that's what it comes down to. Yeah. <laughs> it needs a break somewhere in order to really get built because it's not attractive to, to developers to build affordable housing normally. Right. And the other thing is um, if you're homeless and you're waiting for a house and your only option is to go to a shelter which has a time limit, you know, like you need to be housed or most shelters won't keep you for two years until you get, you know, get into a house or whatever, or until you're got all your documents and you're all set and ready to now move into a house. Um, there needs to be other options available. You know what I'm saying? Because I mean, even if there, we did build 
20, 20,000 affordable, new, new affordable homes. Um, it takes time to build. We've been waiting almost three years, like John said, just for them to, uh, everybody to agree on the okay that we can start building on that piece of property, you know, for the community village. Um, so, I mean, you know, I just, for the emergency situation that could be coming up because, you know, Scott Morishige, the, the coordinator, mm -hmm. state homeless coordinator has said that, you know, the from the last recession, which was nothing like the pandemic, we're talking about the 08, 09, it took like eight, nine years for things to really unfold for like the whole pachyderm to like go down, you know, and the homeless numbers to really peak and then start leveling off. Um, what, what we're looking at here now, I mean, how can we start stemming that? Because the, the eviction moratoriums are off now, right, Ara? I mean, yeah. well, people- And are all the extra money that people were getting from the school and all that stuff, like everything got cut off at one time. <laughs> and, you know, people, the social service agencies are saying the vouchers are there for people who can't afford rent, but landlords, do not want to take them. They rather rent to people who have incomes they think are more reliable. They don't realize that when you've got a when you're on a voucher, oh, you're yeah, automatic. Yeah, automatic. Yeah, John. Yeah, for the duration of the voucher, then problems can arise. So you gotta have some kind of place before they get There's going to be a whole lot of more people on this. Yeah, people don't see it yet. Well, there already is a lot of increase in the numbers as far as I've seen um, on our outreach that we do. Um, well, well, I John does the their cleanups and the community building and the outreach over there at Sun Island. Um, my husband and I usually go out um, where we go to like to Mo'ilihili University, uh, Thomas Square, and things like that. Places, you know, we go to that side. <laughs> you know, Sand Island is the area that the architecture students who helped us actually visited. What's happening in Sand Island now, John, um, with Alan and the whole crew out there? Because many from Kaka'ako. Yeah, they all, I didn't like this. We got, you know, that the place is from the house, this house. The shower, eat stuff. So he has it. We have nothing. He lost everything else too. We're covering his face. Kind of feel for him, but you gotta realize too. You know, they got their face. You can't be coming over all the time. You know, as much as you want to help him, it's hard. Huh? You know, I'm popping in any old time. Hungry, want to shower. You know, when I first came off Sand Island, and I've never been in a transition house before. Um, we're still in the lockdown, 10 o'clock. Uh, all of us, we go home anytime. When you're home, it's hard taking it. People got to tell you, you cannot do this, you cannot go out. Mm -hmm. You know, but, uh, you know, I stuck with it because a handful of you know, people that went up there, there's, there's a lot of people who are taking it in the program right now. You know, it's very appreciated that you know, we had a chance to go up with the street. This, we really swept everybody out of there. There's nobody there today, hardly. But so many people have swept. They've gone into HMO, Alem Maliola, and they've gotten kicked out or they yeah, left. Some or they got bled. kicked out. Some got places. I told them from day one, I wasn't looking for no place. I was with real low house, looking for a place. So. And then, you know, I, I worked like every day for them for a year and a half or nothing. You know? Yeah. I mean, as we show some kind of appreciation. And, there's only two of us left now. Me and another guy, John Cool, probably. We <coughs> worked in another transition house down the road. Family when I'm. Kahawiki Village. And I, I, I'm the groundskeeper over at Hollywood, Mariota. And um, I just been blessed, you know, knowing, uh, knowing we were all again, or I am. You know, me and all guys a lot closer since started this school. And, um, I just got another award from IHS, Employee of the Month. Like, wow. Really? <laughs> How's going on, you know? Right on. <laughs> any, any more awards to be won? 
<laughs> no, I've been blessed. You know, I, those open for me, I just stepped in and you know, took advantage of it. You know. uh, money saved up. Mm. Nice his house on the block. Mm-hmm. You know, it's hard keeping up with trying to get out of place. We're going to all kind of get in. You mean and, trying to get the kauhale? Mm. But we're so hopeful, right? I know I, we still fight and push and try and work through as much as we can, but. For different ways of trying to promote ourselves or whatever. It's been a long two years right now. Well, the model, if you really want to look at how it could be done, it is being done at Pu'uhonua Owayanai. Um, that's where, again, working with Hui Aloha, they, uh, Twinkle Borge and her crew over there, they're so tight, man. They, they have about 187 people there right now, but they have already bought, they have acquired, they purchased land up Mauka from the boat harbor, Waianae Boat Harbor, and oh. building uh, a frame on it right now, the first house in that Kauhale village. And that property was bought with private money and donated money. It was not used from any government funds or any it's people like everybody who might even watch or tune into this broadcast. It's people who just care. We're like, yeah. no, I'm going to do something with this. No, I, um, you had you mentioned earlier about you know the the model that's in the work in the gallery that's featured in the mm -hmm. exhibition and working with the School of Architecture and we have some of the students here. Um, oh, super! This call. Did you want to? Did you want to have them join? Yes, yes, please. You know, um, we really mahalo John Kalupali for his concept of having models be part of the storytelling effort here at the in our installation and to complete that we've we turn to a, a really amazing person um kathy ho shar at the community design center in the uh school of architecture at manoa um she said that she had some students who were interested in uh homeless issues maybe working with homeless and we were like oh maybe could we get this to work out and that is how we came to meet uh, this architecture team. We ended up calling them the A team. <laughs> and here tonight we have with us Anthony Utah and Michael Corotan. Thank you so much, you two. I wonder if you could, you know, just talk to us a little bit about your experience um, working on the project. Um, oh, hi, everyone. My name is Anthony, along with my fellow group member, Michael. Coraton, and I gotta say, this has been one of like, it is the highlight of this year. It was it was a really amazing experience to learn about everything, how, um, yeah, like how the houseless individuals lived, the com their their community. Um, yeah, it it was a really fun experience, especially as architecture students. Um, we learned a lot of stuff that normally a lot of people never would. Um, we saw a lot of design strategies, how. Their, they constructed their homes. We saw stuff like how Allen in Sand Island, um, he dug into the sand. Like at first we didn't think it would be like like that comfortable, but when we actually went inside, it's like, wow, this is actually really amazing. Yeah. Oh, Michael, did you want to add anything to that? No. I don't know if he knows he's muted. <laughs> but you know that you said he dug into the sand wouldn't that uh, by digging into the sand have created it to be a lot cooler in his space yes, yes. honestly we thought like it looks a little hot but then we were really surprised at how like comfortable it was yeah and then like this was yes. the project oh sorry go on no no you oh yeah um th this project was um also very different from what we normally do. As architecture students, we, we make a lot of models, but this was the first time 
our group ever did something like this. Uh, we, we tried to make a lot of this realistic, like, as you can see, we had all this grass. We learned how to sew to make the tents, um, all the trees and everything. Like, normally we never make this the sort of landscaping that we did besides the Kauhale Mall, uh, the um, Kauhale stuff. Um, that one was something that we're so used to. Like, we, we do that every so often. Um, but yeah, the, the two other models of the Kakako Gateway Park and the areas near the um, Children's Discovery Center, um, those are those are really fun for us to make. It was also very new to us too. Yeah. <laughs> You guys did a good job on your sewing and <laughs> great. A lot of really wow, how did they get that? <laughs> thank you guys so much for helping. Yeah. Thanks for us. Uh, thank you guys um, for like letting us help you. It was it was a great experience for us. <laughs> Michael. You have to unmute. Okay. Uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> right on, Michael. You know what? One of you was going to continue working in affordable housing, possibly. Uh, yeah, uh, we could. Uh, from from this point on, we we could uh, expand our knowledge and our experience through um, maybe designing um, solutions for um, housing in Hawaii, even elsewhere outside of the state. Michael, what did you make of uh, Alan's place there? You know, we could not trick out uh, John's, uh, John's shelter in the gallery as much as we wanted to. You know, people love it because it's got, it's got, the, it's got so many uh, details to it, like the solar panel, the bedding, and everything like that. But your actual house, John, was so much more. <laughs> You really had everything. And you had it. I mean, he had automotive tools. Uh, what else did you have? Two, three stoves. He had spices for every kind of spice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. And John was the one who said, um, if you ever need anything, just come to my place. And so after I met him, I felt much more secure in Honolulu because seriously, if I ever needed anywhere, I knew where I could go. Yeah. In this case, you can but <laughs> Really convenient. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Michael. I did want to ask you one more thing, what you thought about um, uh, Alan's place out there in uh, on Sand Island and the other shelters we saw out there. Yes. Uh, so yeah, um, seeing Alan's his tent um, for the first time on San Island, Island was, yeah, it's a great experience for me to see firsthand what uh, what a homeless person or a houseless person um, uh, goes through or lives, in and uh, see what I, I can do to um, or as a group um, find a way a solution to help um, house people in um, such as like our Kahale design concept. Does it seem like that Kalhale could work? Uh, uh, in ter uh, yeah, I, I hope yeah, <laughs> this, this could be the uh, opportunity for people to um, have the necessary needs to, um, uh, necessary shelter to, um, yeah, to house people. Uh, Noi or our John or Anthony or Michael, could, could you folks discuss a little bit more the uh, the concept of the Kahale for our audience? Uh, sure. Um, I could pull up a picture that I have. Oh, sorry. So the Kahale concept was proposed to us initially by the Lieutenant Governor Josh Green. Um, he had brought up this concept of building a community, a village for our community and where we would move our entire community into this space as, at one time. 
instead of placing people, one people, or some people here, some people there, you know, like keeping the community together, which was um, the concept of the Kauhale. And this is a community that has already built relationships, um, have already engaged in uh, service projects together, you know, and things like that. So it's not about after they move in, then trying to work with them to get to a place where they can um, live amongst their their neighbors or the wider community, right? And where it would become a problem, it would they would actually benefit the wider community, you know, by having them there. With their the idea is to to have individual. You have your own individual. Uh, um, you know, your own individual, what do you call this, unit, and then you share um, dining, maybe cooking, showers, toilet facilities, right? So you share, that is where you achieve the savings yeah. um, for this development, is by sharing some of the utilities. And then the purpose of having the houses um, in this format, where they're kind of in separate groups, is because even though we were a, one big community, uh, there are still small communities in that community, you know? So people will tend to group together in their own groups, like maybe among five or six people in a group, you know? So we kind of try to design the space so that each, you know, as people break off into their little groups in the bigger group, they would still be able to be together, right? To me, the main thing we got them to this, you know, I need them, they are walking to me, and they say, you know, you guys need to get a safe zone. You know, somewhere where we can rest our heads. Don't have to worry about getting ripped off. Don't have to worry about the sweet officers. Well, you know, the good team. You don't have to be stopped, protected, you know, especially our stuff. That was our biggest issue. And, um, now where I'm at, I'm at now, I said, Sand Island, four places. <laughs> I'm born and raised on this island, and I never thought I would live there. I said, but, yeah, look where I'm at today. I thought they were all crazy. <laughs> and, you know, we just up, up to the and I, I still wasn't ready to go. You know, because of being through what we've been through, then, you know, Pushed around and thinking we'll go somewhere we don't. Now, you know, I can sleep well, shower, get fed, get money saved up, and I'm working. I'm helping. I'm still helping. I know. Uh, we just need to get our place so we can, we can run on, we can let our head and rest and not have to worry about anything. Like we grow up. I know in the beginning when Alani and um, James and Kathy had brought up the concept of building a community amongst us and about this community village idea and I told them they were nuts. <laughs> but they proved me wrong and I told them if you can get a group of people to come together that's really I'll support you all the way and I'm still here. <laughs> three three years later. <laughs> no, going on four years, yeah, John? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I always bring that up because they they weren't so nuts. <laughs> you know, and once there was just a little bit of change, you notice more and more people who are against it were starting to come and support the community, uh, even residents, you know, in the area who like at once were just totally anti us being there, um, had come out to our cleanups on Saturdays to help clean up the community and the parks and with with our community members, with our house's community members. So, I mean, that was super cool too. But you know, Ara, for people who come to um, see our installation. Yeah. 
you know, if they leave and, and the next time they encounter a houseless or an unsheltered person, I mean, we were just hoping that it might somehow be a little bit different. And a lot of times people are afraid to look at them. You know what I mean? It, 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 do you think that should be so? I mean, I guess I guess that's what I really want to ask. Like, how can we start reacting to each other more as people? You know, we pass each other on the street and to look away, is that really the best thing to do? She got a picture of me bala owing over there. <laughs> no, I mean I think that whether it's homeless people or not homeless people, I, it should we should treat people as people, you know. So I mean you wouldn't just approach everybody, but I mean you don't have to always People are afraid of what they don't know, you know? So once maybe there are a few people that are approachable or that you pass by every day or, you know what I'm saying? Just, mm -hmm. yep. if there were anybody else, you would have said hi by now or, you know, just people are still people no matter where they live and their quality of life shouldn't be determined by the fact that where, of where by the fact that, um, their houses, I mean, their quality of life and uh, their value as a person should be weighed like by who they are, not by where they're living, you know. There are good people and there are bad people in both, on both sides who are in houses, who are not in houses, you know. And we had our share of troublemakers in, in our community that home oh, and these kids gave us a run for our money. <laughs> but I mean, if we can connect people better and get people connected and to work together and communicate with each other, I think a lot of times it's just miscommunication or a lack of understanding, you know. Michael and and Anthony, I mean, do you think you do? Are you do you react differently to houseless people these days compared to before your experience with us? Oh yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, we got to see some of the interviews that Noe did with um, other um, houseless individuals, and it's like you hear their stories. They're they're people just like us, you know, like. None of them ex expected that they would turn out um, in that situations. Um, yeah, it, we just treat them like normal people, you know. Is there a person um, who lives near um, houseless individuals um, in my neighborhood? Um, but yeah, it made me feel like um, I should do something um, to help them. Have a better life so yeah so as a well as an architecture um, major at the university of hawaii yeah so uh, as yeah i i want it i i yeah so we, we want to make a difference uh, for the houses the individuals design homes that will um, help create a better life for them that'd be so great oh man come on Come on, guys, you know, how hard is this? <laughs> it's not that hard until you get the government involved. <laughs> Again, we just have to figure out what are the breaks, what are the give backs, how to make it, you know, cost, cost effective, really. <laughs> so um, we, we are coming to the end of our time. But I just want to take this opportunity, you know, if, if folks want to find out more information about how to get involved or just in general, um, where is there somewhere they can go? I know I know you, there's a website. Um, could you folks just share that information? So our community has a website, uh, kpok.org. Um, it just has it has a lot of testimonies uh, from community members, video testimonies community members that are on there that might um, help people get a better understanding from of where people on the streets are coming from um, 
there is uh, postings of like community events and it hasn't been updated most recently, but I will update it now. <laughs> Another part of our um, exhibit is going up this weekend and that is putting, putting, the, um, putting these stories that, that Ara, John and us have shared um, into the community and they're going to be there um, as QR codes with an ear. You'll see them around Kaka'ako, you know, outside places you probably frequent. Um, check it out. And these are stories of people from the street. Uh, and these stories are available on the street. They're, they're going to start being out there as well. Um, I think that's an exciting part of owning Honolulu because the stories, the history, you know, as much of it, I, I think it, it helps us to love the place more, knowing the stories of the place. Um, and there's a whole lot of resilience and community in the stories about houseless around Kaka'ako. It's, it's um, I hope that's part of what people discover when they come through this exhibit. And we do have weekly Saturday cleanups out in San Island, right, John? We started it this weekend, yeah. Yep. And the way you find out more about that is by, you know, kind of communicating with Hui Aloha. They've got a website too, Hui Aloha. And there's also, you can, there's a website for this art piece. It's called Homeless in Hawaii. And all the material from this art piece is there at that website. There's also a website called Aloha Lives Here. And that's the story of Pu'uhonua Owai and I. Mm -hmm. And so much is going on there, especially during the holidays. Yeah, John, they do so much out there. Oh, there's so much happening. So um, that is another great place to, to go. So I don't know, should we put this all in the chat or? <laughs> Yes, if you don't mind, um, we can put this in the chat as well as um, if you want to find out more information, you can also go to HonoluluMuseum.org where we have a list of resources where you can um, access links to these websites as well. Um, I just want to take this moment to thank you, Ara, Noi, John, Anthony, and Michael. You folks have been so generous with your time, so generous with your thoughts, and we, we can't say enough how appreciative we are to have been able to have this conversation with you and to be continuing to work with you throughout the duration of this exhibition. So thank you so much, everyone. And thank you everyone to the audience who joined us tonight. Um, please come back. You know, we have a, we have a whole series of artist talks taking place throughout the, all through January. So check our website for the specific dates and times. And um, any last thoughts from anyone? Or thank you guys so much for everything. I mean, you know, the HCI did an annual job. Our exhibit looks fantastic out there, I must say. And, um, you know, we got an award. <laughs> Didn't expect that. That was so cool. <laughs> that was so cool. Oh, so so blessed. And we're not done yet. You know, hopefully, uh, <laughs> Well, 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 like I said, thank you guys so much. Yep, thank you. Thank you for having us in your space and for letting us be here and <laughs> be a part of this whole new experience and life. And it's been wonderful. <laughs>